Hi, everyone, and welcome to my talk today at Kubernetes AI Day. Uh, we're going to talk about security best practices for AI on Kubernetes. My name is Guy Salton. I work for a company called Run AI. Run AI uh, provides a platform for orchestrating and optimizing uh, AI workloads on top of Kubernetes. And we'll talk about some security best practices today, uh, a bit about myself. Um, so I'm the solution engineering lead at Run AI. Um, I'm a big fan of Kubernetes, been working with it for a few years now, and I live in Tel Aviv in Israel. And, and let's quickly review our agenda for today. So we'll talk about uh, Kubernetes and containers uh, for data scientists and um, why data scientists are adopting these technologies. We'll then also um, talk about what data scientists need on their day-to-day work and and we'll speak about security concern, concerns that might arise for security teams uh, when running workloads on top of kubernetes and and then we'll see the solution so we'll see how we can help the security team make sure that the jobs the pods that data scientists are running on kubernetes are running in a secure way and um, everything is secure as, and we shouldn't have any uh, concerns and we'll see a demo of how all of these things are running so let's start uh, with uh, a bit of an intro. So data scientists are widely adopting containers today. And this is due to the fact that a lot of the very popular tools uh, that are in the market today uh, that are used by data scientists are built and designed for containers. So you can see a few of the names here. Um, there's also... Um, of course, the NVIDIA and the NGC library, which provides a lot of pre-trained models um, and uh, containers that researchers can work and start uh, getting started very fast and with their models. All of these things were built for containers, and that's why data scientists want to use containers. And when using containers, you know that de facto the new standard uh, for orchestrating containers is Kubernetes. Right, so you can see a few stats here. This is from a recent study that was done by Datadog. You can see that uh, almost 90% of containers are orchestrated and the de facto uh, container orchestration tool today is Kubernetes, uh, used in more than half of containerized environments. Um, the advantages you know, with, uh, were talked about uh, many times. Uh, what we're going to talk about today in focus is what data scientists actually need and what kind of work will they do and how we make sure it's secure. So what uh, do data scientists need? They need to run um, containers that have uh, their deep learning framework inside it like TensorFlow or PyTorch or Keras. Uh, they would need to be able to install dependencies on the, this container uh, based on what their model needs. And they would also need to be able to mount their data into the container. So they probably and usually won't build an image that has the data uh, prepackaged inside it. And because data would be changed frequently, they would prefer to have a container only with the framework tools dependencies that their model needs and then they would mount data uh, from outside from some shared storage and uh, so once they have all of these things they should be able to develop debug train uh, and deploy their models so this is what they need but on the other side you know we have the security team and they're thinking okay you know data scientists want to run their containers and they uh, want to use the kubernetes for that but how do we make sure that researchers don't mess with other containers? We don't want a researcher to mess around with system components or other researchers' comp containers. We don't want a researcher to have access to other researchers' data, right? Data is a big thing, and we don't want uh, a researcher to be able to access somebody else's data, change it, or even, even just read it. Um, and we also don't want researchers to have access to shared resources, meaning uh, they should only be able to work inside their container. We don't want them to access uh, the host running the container, and then they can potentially change things on the host that can affect other users. And, and we don't want them to do that. So how do we make sure that these things are not possible? And let's talk about a few best practices, and then we'll see a demo. So first best practice, uh, like we said, we don't want researchers to mess with other containers. We only want them to work on their containers. 
the solution for that is to create a service account for each researcher, um, which is basically a, like a user definition in Kubernetes. And well, then we'll use namespaces for segregation. So each user would have their own namespace and they would only have access to do things inside their namespace and they won't be able to touch other namespaces. Uh, the second best practice is for the fact that we don't want researchers to access other researchers' data. And to make sure that this is applied, we would need to set the right permissions on the researcher's uh, data directory. And so to make sure that this directory can only be accessible by a certain user. And, and then we would, in our pod definition in Kubernetes, make sure that we use the right user and we mount, mount the right uh, directory. And we shouldn't be allowed to mount somebody else's directory or impersonate as somebody else. And we'll see how this is enforced. And lastly, we said we don't want a researcher to access the shared resources, right? The host where the uh, where the container is, is actually scheduled on. Uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen, we need to restrict the each of the users. So basically restrict the cluster, the namespaces on the cluster um, from running pods with root user and with privilege escalation. We have to enforce and make sure that the researchers run with their own user and they don't try to use privilege escalation to access the host. So we'll see how this can be enforced in Kubernetes. So let's go and see the demo. Um, I created the public GitHub repo with all of the files and examples that I'm going to show today. So you can feel free to access it and, and follow along. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And let's uh, go and start by looking at our cluster. So I have a Kubernetes cluster that I created. Um, and you can see that, let's make sure I use the right config file. So if I run the kubectl get nodes, I can see I have a Kubernetes cluster with three nodes. I have my master node, CPU node, and another node with GPUs. Um, and I said that I want uh, different users to have different namespaces so they won't be able to do things on other namespaces. So let's say I have two researchers in my uh, team. I have a researcher called Bob and one called Alice. And uh, so what the first thing I would need to do is create a namespace for Bob and a namespace for Alice. I already did that. So if I run the kubectl get an S, you'll see I have a namespace called Alice and one called Bob. Um, and now I want to make sure that Bob will only be able to do things inside his namespace and Alice will only be able to do things inside her namespace. So to do that, what we did is we have to create a few resources in Kubernetes. Um, first of all, there is um, one called service account, then a role and a role binding. So we do this for each of the user. Uh, we create a service account role and role binding for Bob and then uh, another ones for Alice. And so the service account is basically a user in Kubernetes. You see, we just create a service account. We call it Bob user. We map it to the namespace Bob. Then we create a role and for Bob, this is also mapped to the namespace Bob and it will basically allow us uh, as Bob to do everything um, that we want, run pods, run jobs, deployments, everything on the namespace Bob. And then a role binding is what binds the service account with the role. So you see, I create this thing called role binding. It's also going to be created in the namespace Bob and it will bind this service account we created called Bob user with the role that we created for Bob. So we did the similar thing for Alice and all of these are in the GitHub repo. So you can just go and run the kubectl apply dash F on this YAML file. And this will create all of these three things uh, for Bob and then other uh, three for Alice. So if we go and run the kubectl get role, for example, on the Bob namespace, we will see roles, uh, Bob's role and we will also see his role binding and his uh, service account. So all of these were created and similarly for Alice. And once we have uh, these three, three things created for each user, we can create a Kubernetes config file. So I won't go too deep into this. Um, we'll have an example in the GitHub repo, but 
you, uh, this is the file that each user would use to access the cluster. So it would have the cluster uh, information, then it will define the user. So Bob will get a config file with the user Bob user and, um, and will only be able to access the namespace Bob inside the cluster uh, using Bob user. Alice will get this file, so she will only be able to access the same cluster with the Alice user on the Alice namespace. So just to see that this works, we can now impersonate, for example, as Bob by using um, Bob's Kubernetes config file, which we just saw now. And you'll see that now if I try to get, for example, pods on the Bob namespace, I'm allowed to do that. Currently, there's no pods running. But if I try as Bob to see pods running on the namespace Alice, you see I'm forbidden. I don't have permissions to list pods on the namespace Alice as well as in any other namespace, only on the namespace Bob. Uh, and similarly for Alice. So this is the first best practice. It's now, um, it's now implemented. Second best practice, we wanted to make sure that uh, each researcher only has access to his or her data. And so to do that, I created an NFS server and I mounted it here to one of my nodes in the cluster, the GPU node. And you can see I created a file, a folder called Alice and one called Bob in my NFS folder. And each of these folders has um, different permissions. So you can see that the folder Alice um, has a permission, oh, the, the only person can access this folder is Alice and Bob uh, can only be accessible by user Bob. And, and to see that what is actually inside, I can go and show you that, for example, in the Bob folder, I have a file called data.txt and it contains one line, uh, which is Bob data. And if I look at, the, the directory of Alice, I'll see that I have a similar data.txt file, but for Alice, it will contain a single line, which is Alice data. So I have two folders, one for Alice, one for Bob. Um, the Bob folder has uh, is accessible only by user Bob. Alice is only accessible by user Alice. Each of them has their own data files. So this is in NFS. Now to be able to mount these NFS directory into my pods in Kubernetes, I have to create two things. So the first one is called PV, persistent volume, and then uh, something called persistent volume claim. And um, so persistent volume defines my uh, volume that I'm going to use. So this is the persistent volume for Bob. You see, I called it NFS PV Bob. It's going to be created in the namespace Bob, and um, it's going to use and access my NFS server this is my nfs server ip and it's going to get my uh, bob folder and similarly for alice we created another one but this would get the names the the alice folder on the namespace alice then we have to create a pvc so to be able to use this volume in our pods uh, we have to create something called a pvc a persistent volume claim so this will uh, this is the resource that we can actually refer to in the pod. So we created one for Alice, again, in the Alice namespace, um, using the same storage class name as the PV, and then one for Bob in the Bob namespace. Um, so we have our storage, PV, PVC, and NFS configured. Um, now, for the last best practice, we said we want to make sure that pods cannot run with uh, root user, they can't run with privileged escalation. So to enforce something like that on our cluster, um, there is something called pod security admission. There are a few things that you can do actually, but there used to be uh, something called pod security policies, but you can see that uh, Kubernetes decided to deprecate it and completely remove it from Kubernetes in version 1.25. So you should be aware of that. The new recommended approach is called pod security admission using an admission controller. Um, it's a new feature. It's in currently in alpha, uh, only available from Kubernetes 1.22. Uh, to enable this alpha feature, you can go and enable um, the pod security feature gate in your cluster. Make sure that you do it both in the kube scheduler, kube API server, and the controller. 
in your master node. Once these are applied, you can enforce different security standards on each namespace in your cluster. So there are three basic standards. And what the standard that we want to use is called restricted. So the restricted standard has heavily restricted policy, and this will prevent pods in the namespace to do unsecure things. So if we look at some of the things that it will enforce, you see that once the restricted standard is enforced on our namespace, it won't allow us to run pods with privilege escalation. It won't allow us to run pods with root user. It will require non-root user um, as well as other things here. So I enabled it on my cluster um, and now to go and actually do it, by the way, I can see that, for example, here in my master node in Kubernetes, if I go to the ETC Kubernetes manifest, uh, I can go and look at my files here. So for example, if I look at the uh, cube um, API server, you should see that under the container commands, I added this feature gate pod security equals true. So it's enabled on my cluster. And, and now if I go and look at my namespace, you can see that I can do, for example, kubectl get ns bob dash o yaml. And I'll see that I added specific labels on this namespace, which are the cube security uh, enforce. Um, and I'm, so I went and actually enforced the restricted policy on the Bob namespace. I did the same thing for the Alice namespace, which means that uh, as the, the, the mode is enforced, when if I try to run pods that don't comply with the security standard, the admission would just block them. And let, let's go and see this in action. So uh, let's go and try to run a pod. I created a pod definition here uh, for Bob. So I would try to go and run a pod in the Bob namespace, and this would run an image called Jupyter TensorFlow Notebook. So it will contain Jupyter as well as TensorFlow. Um, it would go and mount my Bob folder from NFS. So let's see what happens if I impersonate as Bob, and I then try to run this pod. So I'll go and run the kubectl apply pod bob not secure. And you'll see that once I try that, <clears throat> I get an error, right? My uh, pod security admission gives me an error. It tells me that I try to run a pod with privilege escalation. I try to run a pod uh, with a root user. This uh, is not allowed, so I'm blocked. Um, so this is a good thing to apply. Now let's look at a proper pod that is com, uh, is com, is um, is a, uh, where I applied all the security standards. So it's the same image, but this time I added security context and I set the run is not non root non root as true. I specify the actual user ID that I'm going to run this pod with. Five hundred one is the user ID of Bob. Um, I added a few other things here, like the runtime default as the type of my seccom profile. Um, this is also required. I also had to drop all of my Linux capabilities, uh, set my uh, allow privilege escalation to false, so my pod won't be able to do privilege escalation. And then again, I'm going to mount my uh, Bob folder from NFS to this directory, this path in my container. Um, so let's go and see what happens when I try to run this pod. This should now be fine. And I see that now the pod is created. And if I run the get pods on the Bob namespace, I see that my pod is now running, right? For 10 seconds, I should now be able to exec into the pod so exec-it, the pod name in the Bob namespace, and I'm going to use bash for my session. And now I'm inside the pod, and you see that if I run the id command, 
I'm running as ID uh, user ID 501. I'm not, not the root user. And if I try to run sudo su, for example, see, I'm not allowed to run sudo as I don't have privilege escalation. So this is good. And if I look at my file system here, I see that I have my workspace. This is where I mounted my NFS folder. Um, and I have my data file here that was mounted from NFS. I can see my data, it's Bob's data. And if I want to, let's say, install some dependencies, I can run the pip install command to install uh, Keras, for example. So I can run it, it would go and install Keras on my home directory. So everything is good. Um, so that was the demo. Um, going back to our slides, we uh, just for summarizing, we covered you know three best practices. First, to create a service account and a namespace for each researcher, so they would only be able to do things on their namespace. Uh, then the second best practice was for the data, we set the right permission for the researcher's uh, data directory in NFS in our case, and then make sure that we use. Uh, the specific user ID in our pod definition. And lastly, we use pod security admission to restrict um, pods from running with things like root user and privilege escalation. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, you can feel free to contact me either on LinkedIn or email. Um, and uh, thanks.